Okay, so Paul Māori e koutou and welcome everybody to tonight's Te Aumutu Community Board meeting. Um, this is the final meeting for this trainium, so um, it's actually going to be a little bit different. Um, I, some of you may um, in the room have just overheard, but for those of you watching us tonight, I have managed to um, finally have COVID catch up with me. So I'm on um, compulsory stay at home for the next few days. Uh, so what's going to happen next is understanding order 13.10. Um, I need to appoint somebody who is present um, in the meeting rather than being able to chair the meeting myself. So with that in mind, I'm just going to move my screen out of the way so I can tell you what happens next. Um, I would like to um, recommend that the Te Awamutu Community Board nominates Richard Hurrell as their chairperson for the meeting this evening. So can I have someone to move that? You have to flap your arm so I can see Jill. Yep. And a seconder. Kane, thank you. All in favour? Presuming they all said yes, so um, all good. Um, so we'll we'll take that as uh, sorry, none against. No, okay, carried. All righty. So Richard, um, it gives me great pleasure in handing over to you to chair tonight's meeting, uh, especially seeing as it is your your last. Uh, community board meeting. So thank you very much for doing this and it's all yours. Lovely. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody. I know you Anne just done that, but hey, I'm the chairman. So welcome everybody. Um, yeah, we've just got a few formalities that we have to get through before we go on to our public forum. Okay, and uh, there's apologies. Uh, we have an apology for uh, Councillor Susan O'Regan for, uh, for lateness. And oh my goodness, look at this. Hello, Susan. <laughs> so, um, apologies, um, there are none. So can we have a mover and a second? We don't need it. Oh, sorry. We don't need to for that because everyone's here. Okay. Um, then there's a disclosure of members' interests in any of the items. Can you push a button? Yeah, Metasports, so applications as a treasury fund on my own right. Thank you, Lou. Any, any other? Ange? Um, so I'll have a couple, one for ComSafe uh, for their discretionary um, funding application and also for the Te Awamutu Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any, anybody else? Um, mine's Susan. not a conflict, but I just want to put on the table I planted trees for the Te Awamutu food forest, community food forest, so it's not really a conflict. I have no benefit, but obviously I support them online and stuff. So. Okay, thank you. No? All righty, we have a late item, and it's, uh, all the board members have a copy of that late item. Do I read that out now? Yeah. Okay, the uh, late item is a discretionary fund application under section 9 bar 12 of the standing orders of the Tiamidu Community Board can discuss items of business not on the agenda which cannot be delayed as long as there is reason, a good reason for the item not being included in the agenda and cannot be delayed to the next meeting. A discretionary funding application has been received requesting funding for the 2022 Te Amiru Christmas Parade. This matter can't be delayed to a later meeting as the Te Amiru Community Board meeting scheduled is being disrupted because of the local body elections and is unlikely that the community board will meet for an ordinary meeting until December. There is a decision to be made on this item to confirm the spending of the funds for the, from the community board's discretionary funding. So the recommendation is that the Tiamita Community Board accepts a discretionary funding application from Rotary Club of Tiamita as a late item. 
Yeah. And I'll second it. Moved, Susan seconded. Lou, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. All righty. Um, public forum, people. Oh. Oh, okay. It's not my meeting, obviously. Um, confirmation of the order of the meeting. Um, no changes. Thank you, Susan. Hello. All in favour? Hello. Against? Carried. Now we get to um, public forum. As I've um, explained, we have a, a huge um, number of people today, so very short time available, and there is already a batting order. Um, are you are you people aware of the um, the order? Okay, first up is Viv Clark from House of Science, please. You you can push the blue button on that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about the House of Science South Waikato branch. Um, I do need to read words. I'm not in this job because I'm good at talking. I enjoy the kids. So um, we've been operating in this area since 2018 and now have 42 schools enrolled. 21 of those schools are in the Waipa area. We now have a depot in Te Awamutu where the kits are stored and restocked with the help of volunteers. It started in my garage, so we're, we're making great progress. House of Science is now a national brand with 19 branches operating and more expressing interest. Grants and sponsorship are vital because this keeps the soft cost of membership for schools affordable. House of Science has now been accepted by the Education Department to deliver PLD. This is Professional Learning and Development in Schools. This will help us support teachers to deliver science and fully utilize our kits. And it also gives us a much needed income stream. Kits are very expensive to develop. I need more kits to enable me to approach new schools. Sponsorship keeps us operating, but kits need to be funded through grants. The importance of science, it develops critical thinking skills. With the world we're in at the moment, with social media and fake news, science teaches us how to interpret information. Science enables individuals to make informed choices in health and well-being, and it aids economic prosperity. We teach students to love the word science. Our kits have everything for the teacher and students. Everything in that blue box, they take the lid off, and the teacher, everything they need is there, the manual, the handouts, the worksheets, all the equipment and consumables. Um, yeah, easy. They can all enjoy it and they do love it. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody got any questions? No questions, but just a comment. Um, yes. it, your kids are in my children's primary school and they love them. And they're a real hit. They're a real hit with all of the, um, not only the kids, but the teachers too, because obviously they, they struggle to know how to teach a lot of these things in an accessible manner. So, yeah, absolutely love the work you do. Well Thank, done. You. Thank you. Cool. Just to follow up, how long does a kit actually last in, a, in an operation like at the school? So your kit is supplied. Is it just reusable numerous times? Or? Um, a kit is booked on a fortnightly basis. Okay. We deliver it on a Monday. It's collected the following Thursday. Restock it. Right. So it's ready to go out to the next school that's booked it on the Monday again. So everything's checked over and it goes out 100% ready for the next next school. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's quite interesting. Thank okay. you. Just interested, um, sorry, just interested sorry. how many um, students does that sort of cover when they get, that box gets dropped off? Is it just an unlimited or is it? It's designed it for 30. Yep. students yeah um some schools i will send out extras if, if you know that they request it um but basically 30 students and the teacher are just fully equipped yeah thank you cool thank you and do you view any question no thank you okay shani from loving arms Thank you all for having me here today, and thank you for um, for even just you know um, considering us as a worthy 
donatee. Um, so since 2014, so it's nearly, it's over eight years ago, we've helped 3,000 families around the Waikato um, with things for baby. Any um, family in need can apply to us. Um, about 75% of our referrals come from other social agencies, such as social workers, Oranga Tamariki, WINS, the police, Family Start, Plunkett, Midwives. Um, we can supply families with clothing, bedding, cots, car seats, bassinets, toiletries, nappies, anything to do with baby up until about the age of two. Um, it started in my outside room and um, we have now got a building down Rickett Road and we are boosting at the seams already. So um, this week has been particularly busy and we are delivering 35 packs around the Waikato all the way from Huntley down to Matamata and Morrinsville and Waitoa and Tiamu, of course, yes. Yeah, thank you for considering us. Any questions? Yeah, just a quick question, Shane. Thanks very much for your presentation. And I can see the need for these sort of things. Uh, your packs, was that a weekly thing for 35 or was it a daily? Um, our packs range from about 20 to 35 a week. A week. And exactly. um, my yeah. husband, bless him, does all the deliveries on a Wednesday. I did them all last year um, by myself and some of the situations you go into aren't particularly pleasant, so he does it on my behalf. Thank you, Shano. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Cool. No further questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Okay, Janet. She's online. Oh, Janet. Oh, cool. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Janet Buckingham. I'm the Administration Manager for MSY Cato. Um, um, we provide these support services in the region for people with multiple sclerosis, Huntington's disease and allied neurological conditions. Um, we've been providing those services since um, 1963. Um, so we're currently providing support for 51 clients and the families in WIPA. And we employ two client services staff. Um, Client Services Manager Liz, um, she's a registered social worker and previously a nurse. Um, Karen, our Client Services Coordinator, um, was previously a registered nurse. So as field officers, they're the ones that are out and about in the areas, um, whereas I myself are office based. Um, so essentially, they work really closely with people who are newly diagnosed and they're supporting them with reliable, robust and up-to-date information um, together with symptom, man symptom management strategies um, for themselves and the families. And they undertake this as soon as possible after a diagnosis and continue with that information and education whenever it's needed. Um, we also work hard to support our people when they're unwell and often the link between them, the hospital and community services offering suggestions and pathways for care and support. Um, so we support our clients with home visits, um, phone support, information, education resources. We produce a quarterly newsletter and um, provide support at neurology or likewise appointments. And we also run a bi-monthly support group in TMO too. Um, so being diagnosed with one of these like neurological conditions is life changing and it's lifelong too. So for the majority of people, their knowledge of the conditions limited. And um, so providing support and education is essential. And many of our clients also require support with anxiety and fear and depression. So the conditions affect not only the client, but also their families too. And often they're the ones that become the carers. So it's essential that we're able to support them as required too. Um, and in providing services, we provide evidence-based advice and information and work to empower people to make informed decisions and lifestyle choices. So we strive to support our clients as and when they need this to improve their health and well-being. Um, enabling them to enjoy life and be integrated and participate more in community life. Um, One minute. We, 
Um, so yeah, we also provide um, education for employers and rest homes as required too. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit more about our services and from considering our application. Is there any questions? No questions. Thank you, Janet. Oh, sorry. Just one quick one. Um, thank you, Janet. Um, you've said that we there are 55 um, families you're working with across the WIPA. Yeah. Do you have any further um, granular detail, unless I missed it, on actual families in Tilmoti, the number? We've got 19, 19, 19. families, um, or 19 clients and the families that we're supporting in Tilmoti. Lovely. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Okay, Chris Johnson from the Health Tiamuto Community Health Transport Trust. Well, thank you. Um, the Health Transport Trust is commonly known as the Health Shuttle Trust, and I think everyone knows what that does. Um, our funding application is for the uh, replacement of two wheelchairs that we use on our service to um, wheel um, clients into hospital and around the hospital become evident recently that um, uh, a, our old chairs, which are about 10 to 15 years old, are small, old and heavy. And after a couple of breakdowns, we've found that um, parts are almost impossible to get. So hence, we need to update. Um, the other thing that's uh, become evident is that um, our clients in this day and age are getting larger and heavier and uh, more difficult to wheel around, um, especially really when our volunteers, most of them are age 65 plus. So hence, um, we need a couple of new wheelchairs. And um, these are sort of weren't in our budget, um, but they need to come evident after the, in recent months. Um, if you read our budget, we're always in a deficit situation anyway. So any, um, assistance that can be given would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chris, any questions? No question, Chris, but uh, I totally exonerate, so I know exactly where you're coming from. Um, mm. We've got the same with the RSA, so <laughs> we've got two old wheelchairs, right. which, uh, as you know, they can't be parts, and they tend to deflate wheels and all sorts of things go wrong, but they're not designed to take the heavier person. Okay, so the cost of the is included in the uh, approach, yeah, is it? Yes, absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Chris, I had a look too um, at the type of wheelchair that you're looking at, and I looked into that, and that's a really good buy. That's a really um, very sturdy one and, oh, and very good. reliable. Yeah, well, yeah. Our, our, our current coordinator is an excellent person. She did a lot of research into those, and that's what she came up with. Thank you. No further questions? No? Thank you, Chris. Okay, Michelle Richardson from the Toy Library. No? Okay, let's we'll see what happens. Glenda and Brian Barclay from Timothy Little Theatre. Oh, so many worthy causes. <laughs> Don't envy your choices. Um, Yes, I'm from the Little Theatre and Glenda is the president, so she's here to answer the uh, hard questions. A bit of background on the theatre. It costs us about $4,500 a year to operate it. There's some fixed costs. On top of that, there's maintenance. So if we have to call an electrician or a plumber uh, or glazier, then uh, that's additional to that. Um, we're also progressively using our savings to replace the old theater lights, you know, the old really hot lights that uh, are operating. They're a bit of a fire hazard. Um, so we're replacing them with modern lights, which have a, um, a few more features as well. Um, but every light is over $1,000. So um, that's why I say progressively we're, we're doing that. For the rest of this year, we've got um, a children's group in the theater uh, learning Shakespeare on one day. Uh, we've got a traveling roadshow from Creative Waipa coming through, and we're rehearsing currently for November's production of Shirley Valentine, which is, is mentioned in the uh, application to you. Plays are a bit of a balancing act. Um, if you've ever put on a play, you realize there's considerable upfront cost involved 
as you um, have to pay for rights and uh, um, for the play itself. You also have to play uh, pay rights for music um, uh, in the play and during half time, which <laughs> strikes me as strange, but you do have to do that. Um, and of course, we also have things like hardware for altering the set, uh, wood, uh, costumes and props and advertising. So all of that sort of up front. And then we can't charge too much for seats, otherwise people won't come. So it's a, um, it, it means we struggle to make sufficient profit to cover our four and a half thousand dollars a year that we need to actually keep the theatre going. So that's why um, this is quite important to us, the grants like this, um, because it, it does keep us operating and, and keeps us helping the community with, with theatre. So thank you. And Glenda will now answer the hard questions. <laughs> Good on you. Well done. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Any questions? Ange, have you got a question? Yes, please. Just a quick one. Um, where did you norm? Um, how did you fund your royalties previously? Depending on how successful the previous show was, you sort of have to put aside that basic money that you are going to use for the next show has to be kind of held in abeyance waiting until your next show comes along. Uh, a lot of our shows, we've actually written scripts ourselves. We've uh, big borrowed and, I won't say stolen, <laughs> <laughs> scripts from other, from other uh, societies and groups that have written things and they charge, I don't know, $10 or 10% of box office or something. So if we're in a bit of a hole, we have got other folks that we, we will try and get in contact with and they will say, oh, look, you know, use that script and then we'll put on a show and that way we've got that $1,500 that's our normal um, upfront cost for the rights to something. But then you still, it, it mean, what it means is that you are putting on a production that is not well known because right. it, uh, yep. it's a homemade one. And if you want to have proverbial bums on seats, then you have to put on something that people can understand, have seen, know this, know that there's going to be a good show, and that's where you end up having to pay the money for them. All the good shows cost a lot of money. Yep, no, understand that. Thank you. Thanks, Glenda. <laughs> oh, right. yeah, thank you very much. It, it's quite interesting listening to you. It, I just wondered, when you do these shows, do you actually have a, a set aside of capitation or a set of money? For repairs and maintenance, or not? You, do, you just sort of a, you don't allow. You just do some show to show, or do you allow a little bit of saving at the moment to actually operate your costs? We do actually have a, a, a an amount that goes slightly to one side, so that okay. we we have been in positions. When I first joined the theatre here in 1995, it was four hundred dollars in the bank. And that's not enough to put a show on. No, so we have worked very hard to get it to the point where it can semi-sustain itself with a bit of assistance. Is this a, a lease building or is it? This is a lease it, building. It belongs. Council, it? Well, it's the it's the old Roach Street yeah, School. Yeah, it's no, a council no. building. That's right. And the council, God bless them, are going to put in a heat pump for us, which okay. is marvelous because we had the police, we had the firemen. Sorry, over doing a training session in our building the other week, which was really quite interesting. They filled the place with smoke and they crawled around on the floor and, right, and it was, right. um, it, it was lovely. You could have filmed it and had it as an act. It was, you know, it, it really was, it really was quite fun. It was very informative from our point of view, watching them. Um, right. So yes, we get used for oddball things. You don't. Right. Thank you okay. very much. Thank right. you. Right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay, uh, Heidi Gleason from True Colours. Hello everyone, I'm Heidi and I'm from True Colours Children's Health Trust. We're a charitable trust that's based in Hamilton and we support children with a serious health condition and their families. And uh, increasingly, we also support bereaved parents who um, have had a poor medical diagnosis of uh, um, their baby while in utero and we'll support them through um, their decision-making process or whether they carry that pregnancy on. 
Uh, we're currently actively supporting 253 children and their families. So we support the child with the serious health condition, their parents and their siblings and their wider community around them. So this could be their um, school, for example, and their other um, extended medical professionals involved in the care of the child. Um, we've been running since 2004 when Cynthia Ward started the um, True Colours um, with the vision of supporting you know, or ensuring that all Waikato families impacted by their child's health condition had access to support. So we provide our service free of charge and um, part of our grant is for fuel and phone costs of servicing our rural clients and so that we can provide equitable care um, to them and so that they're not always having to come into town that's sometimes difficult due to finances or if they've got an unwell child that can make traveling in and out a bit difficult too. So actually 47% of our referrals are rural based. So um, that's within the Waipa, but also greater Waikato regions. And I don't have an exact number of how many in Tiawamuta we do because we're doing a database merge at the moment and it's proving a bit challenging to pull the numbers. Um, so a little bit more about us exactly. So essentially we support families with counselling, clinical and emotional support. We do play, art and music therapy with the kids and we do that. Um, in at True Colours House, which is in Frankton, we come out to um, their homes, to schools, and we also go up to the hospital. Um, so we provide training and presentations for health professionals um, involved in the care of the unwell child. And we are 100% community funded through donations, grants and fundraisers. So we get no funding from the DHB or the government, um, despite the fact that about 50% of our referrals do come from the DHB. Um, so as I said, our service is free and I'm proud to say we have no waiting lists, which has been a bit of a thing in the media lately. So, um, you know, when a family is referred into us, they're generally in a time of crisis and um, we make sure that we can get to them pretty quickly and wrap around them as needed. Yeah, cool. any questions? Thank you. No questions? Sorry, yes, I'm horrid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you operate without, within the Waipa, but you also operate within Hamilton as well. And do you operate yes. in Waikato as well? Or? We do. We actually okay. do the, um, essentially the Waikato DHB area. So we go up to Mere Mere, down to Tomanui, Tokoroa, we, um, oh, okay. yeah, Coromandel. So, so you, you, you receive other sources of funding outside the application? Yes, we do. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and we um we're yeah very privileged to have been going eighteen years, and that is solely down to the generosity of community funding. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Right. Thank, Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Is that Michelle? Is that you that wandered in? Lovely. I called your name, but you didn't answer before, so, right. and then my, you walked um, in. Babysitter to arrive, and then next year. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I'm Michelle. Um, I'm from the Toy Library. This is us. Um, the Te Ao Murder Community Toy Library um, is a toy loan service. Um, a lot of you might have heard about it because it's been around for about 30 years. Um, it's run by a paid librarian and volunteer parents. Um, I've got three boys. We love using the Toy Library. It's an amazing resource for our family. Um, the last couple of years, it's really lacked from um, support, volunteer support, um, parents working and busy. Um, so I found myself in the president role, um, but I'm really passionate about it. So I'm happy to do that. Um, and we've got a new committee together and we're really working to um, bring the toy library service up to a really great standard and being really appealing to families and so they can find it a great resource as well. Um, over, um, so we've got ourselves into a bit of a tough financial position. Um, however, in the last year, we've applied for quite a few grants, um, particularly um, council grants. We apply for um, get our funding from um, lotteries grants, a small amount, um, and COGS as well. So we've got ourselves into a much better financial position. Um, we're refreshing the space up, um, and we'd like to open for more hours. So at the moment, the Twitter Library has been open. Um, on a Tuesday from 3.30 to 4.30 and on a Saturday, 9.30 to 11.30. Um, the feedback that we've had from parents is that that's not long enough um, for them to be able to get in if you've got Saturday sport, you know, that only looks Tuesday if you're working. Um, and the reason that we, we have had more hours in the past, 
um, but it was a cost-saving thing when we were in a tough financial position. Um, so we have applied for the grant and we're, um, uh, to open an additional day, so a Wednesday. So um, there's a bit updating in our draft budget that we um, proposed. So our annual wage bill for our paid librarian is um, for two days is around 3,700. Um, so it's just over 6,000 if we open that additional day. Um, but we feel that this is really critical for us to be able to um, be a more um, available, useful service for families to use. Um, yeah. Yep. Cool, thank you. Uh, okay, um, hi there. How many um, families use the, the service? Um, we've got about idea? 50 families using the service, but we think that it's really underutilized. Um, we are doing a, well, so we've created flyers, we're um, dropping them off to all the daycares. A lot of people don't know about the toy library and we've heard that from um, a lot of people um, when they heard about the toy library service for the first time. So we think it's underutilized. Um, yes, so we think that we can get a lot more families using it. And on the plus side, more families using it, um, less waste going to landfill, less families needing to spend money on toys, being able to provide more enrichment for children. Uh, it's, it's an awesome resource in terms of keeping kids busy, learning through play. So there's good scope for it to be used much more than it is. But the families do, do use it, um, also get a lot out of it as well. But it's just got that scope to have more. Sorry, and there's no, there's no charges there, it's just a... Yes, um, so it's a membership model. So um, we've got a couple of tiers, but a family membership is $45 a year. Um, and then we've got community services, a grandparent membership. Um, I think that's the, yeah, the options. Um, and then families pay 50 cents to $3 for a toy. So we've got all sorts of toys. We've got big write-ons. We've got um, things you could hire for parties. We've got puzzles, baby toys. So um, a wide range of toys from age zero to seven. Cool. Oh, yeah. any further questions? Ange, you're right. Goodness gracious. I'll just say something. Um, I totally understand the logic of increasing your hours and availability. I know when I was working mum, it's really hard to get, you know, when I had kids at that age, really hard to get in there. And I think I, because they're a late phase two for returning, aren't they? Uh, yes. Yeah, I yeah. think I paid a fair few of those because <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even get them back on time. Um, but so I can understand the logic and trying to expand your hours and expand yeah. your base. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's sort of like there's lots of bits that we've needed to work on and that's a, a really important piece of the puzzle for us to make oh. a better service. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, everyone. Okay, John Wood from ComSafe. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, we've just um, improved our communication systems with the phones and internet and things like that. Um, we have our two patrol cars have a phone in them each, plus their radio with the police. But Mandy, our coordinator, she's got one, and hers is very important. Um, part of the problem before was we would get information in a roundabout sort of way, and by the time she got it, it was all distorted. Now most of that stuff goes to her straight away and then she can deal with it straight away. And it just makes her life easier and makes everything else easier for us. And yeah, so we just need funding to um, look after the phones and the internet system that we've got. And as you know, we do a very, very important job around the district. In more ways than one. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> um, yeah, I do know what you do, and I was to say I really, really think that you do an excellent job around the community, and it's a volunteer service, predominantly at the front anyway. Yeah, yeah. And as I say, having the facility to be able to communicate is vitally important with this because using, as you did before, using cell phones, you did have a limitation in having connection rapidly enough. This way you can yeah. use radios, you're on a secure channel. Yeah. and you can get the information backwards and forwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that Mandy gets comes from the public, and before they were going through a different system, 
So yeah. we've changed it so it suits us, so that Mandy gets all that information. She's the focal point at the, you know, the, at the end of the things, and she, then she can deal with that. If she needs to talk to Ryan or one of his offsiders, she can, and they can work from there. She can also redirect you in your compensate cars if you're out at the time yeah, to, to yeah. the locations and that it, you're and, talking about. And it's a safety issue because, um, with you know, Mandy's out on her own. The trolls normally together. They have was it two in a car, but with Mandy, she's sort of on her own and does it during the day and goes to different places within Tiamudu, even Otrahonga and places. So, yeah, she does get around. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, John. Cool. Susan, I'm all for anything that makes Mandy's life easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, so do we. Because, <laughs> you know, she is doing a fantastic job for us. That's mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. We were lucky to. We picked the right person when we interviewed them. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you, John. Okay, that's um, our public forum for the discretionary funding. Um, when it comes to uh, our discussion later on in the meeting, it will be um, public excluded, or oh, part of it will be public excluded. So um, you, yeah. Later on in the meeting, you'll find out the result. So, um, yeah, you don't have to wait around if you don't want to, um, but you're more than welcome to uh, to stay. We can't give you a time frame, but um, hey, this is our agenda. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for your time. Aha. Uh -huh. They got well used today. <laughs> Silly question. Silly question. Yeah. Okay, now we've got Megan Preston uh, Prescott from uh, Tiamatu Food Forest giving us a um, some comments on her project. If you can just push the blue button, Megan, please. Oh, it's all right. I'll I keep it short. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll talk fast. <laughs> well, thank you for having uh, me today. Um, I'm just here to talk about the Tiamata Community Food Forest. Um, it's a it's a group of um, it started at, it started now as. Um, groups of orchards um, throughout Te Aumutu. So we've started in Pika Pekaro Reserve um, behind Pika Pekaro School, which goes right up to Cambridge Road. And we planted a couple of weeks ago four forests here, which are clumps of trees. Um, this food forest is going to go throughout Te Aumutu. We've also done planting in Forley Place, <laughs> thanks to Susan's help, in <laughs> um, Forley Place and Sherwin Park. And next week we're planting um, along the walkway at Te Aumutu Sports Club. Um, they're all edible trees. They're presented in a way that makes you want to walk from one forest to the next. And um, they're going to come up with signposts and we've got a kereru as a... Um, a kereru as our mascot that's going to be on all the signs and tell a bit of a story about it and takes you on to the next place. Uh, the first, um, let's start with Pika Pekaro Reserve. Um, the school, the children of the school are going to be the guardians of that forest. Um, and they, uh, um, you can scan a code on the orchards um, on one of the signs and the children will be talking, introducing their forest, introducing um, Tiaki, which represents the school that's a little um, the Pekka Pekka at Sabat. It's one of their mascots, which meets up with the other one. Um, and it just takes you on a walk throughout the, um, that area. Um, we've thought carefully about every area that we've planted in. So near the schools we've, and the sports clubs, we've gone for easy peel mandarins and um, plums and sort of extended the ripening season. So it's not in the school holidays, but we've had late ripening fruit and um, 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 early ripening fruit so we can hopefully in the parks get about six months worth of fruit at the moment so eventually we want all of the um all of the food forests the walk to link up 
and um, we're talking with um, trying to get a copy, which we will when it's ready, of the urban mobility plan and maybe plant around, working with them and plant around that. But hopefully at the end, you'll be able to walk through Te Amaru for about 15 kilometres through these food forests. We've got citrus walks, we've got um, Fijoa arches um, and trying to make every forest um, and orchard interactive and um, really attract people and make them want to go from one to the next while providing fruit. Um, we'd like to think that um, we've thought of a lot of um, things like excess fruit, um, vandalism, um, but um, with the excess fruit, we're talking with Waikiria Prison, especially in down by Peka Pekera Reserve. Um, a lot of families are drawn to the schools and um, into the area to live here because they've got far now at Waikiria Prison. So we've spoken to Waikiria Prison. They're going to grow seedlings for us so they can effectively help feed their families. They're going to use it in their horticulture program and with excess fruit, they're going to bottle them and give us a preserved fruit bag. We're, we're providing training for the prisoners to bottle it, give the fruit back and hopefully keep the funding rolling for the food forest. Um, it's going to be linked by many ways. It's um, the reason for it is for everybody. It brings community together. It brings communities, neighbourhoods together and trying to get the kids um, or the people in that area to own it, to really, this is my backyard. This is an extension of my backyard. Um, down in Highfield, we planted lots of limes for the gins where we wouldn't do that near the school. <laughs> um, so just trying to, you know, get everyone a sense of belonging um, from the food forest and draw people to the area. So we've got a lady, um, she's really clever. Um, she's a third year student at the Waikato Polytechnic and, sorry, Twin Tech. And her role is um, working up with us for a year. Um, she's doing the design, helping with the signs, but also designing an app. So you can jump into anywhere on the food forest and the app will take you around, tell you what fruit's ripe, where, recipes, what you can do. Um, one reason I'm um, speaking tonight is to make, I want to make other community groups aware of our project because we want to make every forest interesting. So, for example, along um, by Tiamadu Sports, we would love to put sports equipment in through the forest and design it that way. But I believe there's another community group that's doing that in town. So maybe we could make connections and talk about, hey, is this a good spot for it? We want to put chairs in. We've got places to reflect, places to be. But just make the, each orchard really interesting. So you're at one orchard, you read the signs, you can listen to the kids talk, and you really want to move on to the next forest so sort of really attraction for Tiamudu so that's um that's it in a nutshell really cool. any questions hi hi this sounds fantastic my cup of tea but um so I know you've thought of all the different aspects so if somebody was to late at night go into one of your food forests and just pick a strip 10 trees mm -hmm. and leave all the rubbish around and all the peelings and whatever. Is there anything to stop people doing that or? Um, no, there's not. Um, we've thought about theft of the fruit and if it goes well, the model, we're going to um, do veggies as well. But we have thought about the theft and if the fruit or that is just stolen or nick, we kind of feel like it's a good thing. Um, if people are stealing food, if they're using it, it's not going to waste. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, Leaving all of the, um, the um, if they, you know, leaving a mess on the ground, um, we have worked quite closely with Matt from Parks and Reserves. Everything, all of the fruit and the varieties we've chosen is sort of you can mow over and get back into mulch. Um, we've also got a group making picking bins. So if there is um, fill on the ground, um, the kids or, or the volunteers in that can pick it up and put it into the picking bins for people to help themselves. We are expecting maybe a bit of vandalism um, and that's why we're trying to create a little bit of um, respect and, and mana within each community that they're done. Down by Pekero School, we've gone and introduced ourselves to all of the houses in that area um, uh, and you know we've had a really, really incredible response. Um, but also the kids are going to have their um, murals along anything that can be graffitied and is getting graffitied at the moment. We're doing murals with the kids' silhouettes in there and, um, and Mr G, who's quite a um, 
quite a really well-respected mural artist, he's going to invite anyone in the area to come and paint with him. So um, it's been shown in other areas that have had problems with graffiti that um, they haven't been graffitied after the murals have gone up. Mm. So we're just hoping that we're gonna we're gonna really work on getting that respect um, within that community so that you know they'll feel like they're ripping up their own backyard if they are doing it. We'll see how it goes. We did the planting three weeks ago for the reserve and I've checked on them every day and they're still all in the ground and I'm taking that as a win so far, but we've just got to keep building on that. I'm sure it'll go well. There's always little hiccups, but I'm definitely sure 100% it'll go well. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. Inch. Um, yeah, Megan, awesome, awesome idea and um, congratulations on, far, on how far you've come um, to date, uh, fantastic to um, see your little video the other the other day on Facebook. Oh, thank and you. Guys, yeah, putting putting the trees in and and um, you, your team of volunteers out there digging away. So yeah. no, great job and and wonderful to see such a an amazing initiative. So I was a little bit curious. Did did you come up with this yourself, or had you seen it somewhere done somewhere else, or just was interested in where the idea came from? It's actually turned into a little bit of an accident. <laughs> it started as um, it started as an idea of a um, down by the church with a really messy garden, and oh, yeah. um, we wanted to tidy it up and make it. You know, is it available? What's happening to the fruit there? And then um, I spoke to Gina and Matt, and um, thought of you know they gave us offered us to borrow a piece of land in a different location. Um, and then so we had a plan drawn up and did a bit of research and contacted a few, you know, did a bit of homework and um, took all of the plans back to them and the council and they sort of propelled the idea to the next level. That's such a great idea. We need bigger land. Oh, we've got this one. We've got this one. Have a look at this. And then the idea evolved pretty quickly from then. Um, we've also been donated a guy, 80 hours from... Um, he does media release um, from the Huntley Council. Oh, okay. um, and he, um, Jed, is um, on our team and he's doing social media, press releases, but he's really managing how we bring our story to the public, to the town, um, and told in a way that will get that buy-in. Um, we've been donated 80 hours from him. So his job is not only to bring our um, concept and the whole plan to the town and introduce the public to our plan and create that buy-in, but if it goes well, he wants a really good idea of how it's done because they want to recreate the model in Huntley if it goes well. So they're giving us 80 hours, one year down the track, and then they'll want to recreate the idea in um, Huntley. Oh, look, that's way, way cool. And, and let's hope that we see um, fruit forests flourishing all over the country as a result of this wonderful idea. Well done. Just awesome. Oh, thank Absolutely you. awesome. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Luke. Yes, yeah, Megan, thank Quickly. you very much. Yeah. An excellent presentation. Very, very, very aware of it. Uh, well, TA Sports, you actually got an area where you were looking at Albert Park, or where was it that you were looking at that area? Oh, at Albert Park, it's just right down by the path. That, um, there's already the park down there. That, down by the cricket nets. Yeah, okay. yeah. So just um, just along that path, it's not going to be a, um, a big um forest down there but the path I believe is getting lined with um Fijoa trees and then there's a small bank that's getting some mandarins but it's not going to be a huge forest but it's an integral part of the walk that links um a few of the forests together so just keeping it interesting and each forest within walking distance of the next so that people can really do the rounds of them just one other point too that at Memorial Park we had planned uh, to have a small uh, garden or actually trees there to represent the old gardens that were around the old mission house. So that was an area that's actually in our, our plan at the moment. So whether you talk to the right people in council, I'm sure that we could look at that sort of situation oh, and uh, help you with that perhaps a little. Oh, that's incredible because we, um, we really want to get our idea across so we're not stepping on toes or doing the same work other community groups are planning to do. You know, um, we've actually gone to a couple of Zane Beckett's been a huge sponsor um, partner of this thing, uh, of this project. And he's like, when he's got new subdivisions going up, he's gonna keep it in mind when he does the plans, 
so that we can turn it into part with either sculptures or play equipment or something. So it's good to get the message out there so that we can work with other community groups to make it one big project instead of, you know, a disjointed project. Right, John, Thank very quickly, so we'll, I'll allow it. I just want to ask you a question, because I live in Oak Ridge. Oh, yes. It's pretty open in there. Have you got anybody that's going to monitor it? Um, oh, right. Do you mean for, um, for theft or for um, keeping care of them? Yeah, we've got um, we've got a we've got a maintenance plan. Um, the Waikato WinTech have put it into their um, schedule in their horticulture department to do the pruning and monitor the plants for the next six years. They've built it into mm. their program. Um, yeah, we've got people looking after it and look if they get nicked, we've just got to try and. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Megan. You. Cool. All right. And I think you need me. to look at so, something. So, yes, please. Thank you. Um, so have we got a Gary Dubashire floating around out there somewhere? Yeah. Well, I don't know about floating. Oh, excuse me. So I would like to get Gary and and Richard somewhere close together. That'd be good. Um, you come this way, Gary. <laughs> so I can see you. So I can see you. <laughs> Richard. So, Good day. So, so I would just um, like to make a very special thank you to these very special gentlemen who have dedicated a very big chunk of their lives to the Te Aumutu Community Board. Um, and we just want to acknowledge the dedication and the time and the effort that you have both put in. I think, I hope I've got this right, but Richard was 15 years and Gary 13. Um, and both of you have spent uh, some of that time chairing Te Aumutu Community Board meetings as well um, and, and leading, leading the way forward um, and, and looking out for the best interests of Te Aumutu, Kihi Kihi and Kakapuku. So I won't go on any longer because um, I, I have got no more words to express just the awesome, awesomeness of you both and the wonderful, wonderful job that you have both done. So hopefully I've got Lou standing by with a certificate to present to each of you. So which one have you got first, Lou? Oh, sorry. I'll get up here. I've got Gary first. Okay, so congratulations, Gary, Gary on behalf Thank of you. the Telmutu yeah. Community Board. Well done. Oh, you deserve that. Yeah. 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 And congratulations and thank you, Richard, on behalf of the Te Aumutu community. You're thinking getting out of urban miners, you're joking. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just um, um, like to nominate Gary to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't get out of it that easily. Probably not. Uh, and listen, thank you so much um, for, the, for those kind words. Um, it, I have to say, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to serve the board, to serve the community, and I have to thank uh, my current board members, uh, Lou, absolute pleasure sitting beside you, Susan, for your absolute wise words and your passion and commitment to the community. Um, I have to say to Jill, uh, it's been fantastic working with you, Zane, very passionate about your particular causes. Um, I've got Karen over here to thank so much for your support. Don't you get out of it um, as I was chair. So just keeping me on track and making sure that I did the right things at the right time. So an absolute pleasure with you. Um, to the staff, to Brian, we didn't always see eye to eye, Brian, on some roading issues there, but I have to say thank you for your support and uh, your understanding uh, for Gary down there as well. Uh, Luke, nice to see you again as well. John, uh, in the corner there, thank you for um, for the interactions that we've had as well. Uh, for Richard, I was at school with Richard back in the day, so uh, we go back a long way. 
So all in all, um, thank you to everybody. And uh, also thank you to my long-standing wife, Christine, because we forget about the people that mm. stay at home and cook the meals, uh, wondering when we're going to come home when we're still here at nine o'clock at night running extensions to make sure we get through the business of the day. So, you know, the family members that we have that support us there go unnoticed. So a really, really good thank you to, uh, to Christine for supporting me. So thank you so much. Thanks to you all. Good morning. Good morning. That's it. That's all. That's all we all we need. Yeah, I second it. <laughs> so no, thank you very much. It's um, yeah, it's been a very very interesting time. A great great way to learn what. Um, council is about and what local government is about. Um, very, we, we got to meet so many people, um, different walks of life and um, different uh, ways of thinking, which um, makes it very interesting. So, uh, yeah, no, I've enjoyed my time. But Tuesday nights are now mine. So <laughs> good luck to everybody on that uh, who's who's going for the uh, um, in the upcoming elections. Thank you. Um, and just a, a final word from me, you two don't get too far away because I'm sure that um, future community boards would uh, love to pick your brains and use your expertise and um, and you know be able to utilize some of that experience going into the future because it's too good to be to be completely retired so thanks again and also yeah thank you to Christine and to Gail for for letting us have these two lovely gentlemen in our midst for all this time so all the best to you both and thank you thank you back to you all righty okay next on the agenda is a confirmation of the minutes of the Tiamuti Community Board dated the 9th of August 2022 is circulated with the agenda as a true and correct record of proceedings. Moved low, seconded Jill. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Okay, we have a deputation today from Luke East. If you'd like to. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be back here, although it is in the saddest of times that I meet with you again mm -hmm. to update you on the progress made thus far towards the funding of the park, uh, which was approved last year by Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. When I was first approached almost two weeks ago about addressing this meeting, little did we know what they would have in store. Queen Elizabeth was, for many people, as much a part of our lives as our own families. She was the only sovereign most of us will ever have known, and hers was a face which we saw in some form on a daily basis. She had the power to bring us together and give us strength in the darkest of times, and in our times of celebra celebration gave voice to our joy. As the mayor said earlier this week, this is a time of deep and very real sadness for our district. We've lost someone whose entire life was committed to duty and service, and who for the past 70 years of her life has touched many lives, including through some of the 500 charities and organizations of which she was patron including here in the district. And I'm sure many of you have your own experiences with some of the charities. Uh, the plaque which I proposed in 2020 and which I first addressed to the board about days after the sad passing of the late Duke of Edinburgh uh, is a fitting way to honor Her Majesty's life of service and devotion and to forever preserve the history of her visit to our town of which I know at least one of you was there. <laughs> um, it's very poignant now to be here discussing this with you as a lasting tribute to her memory and, of course, to the Duke of Edinburgh as well. Um, I know having her in our town meant a lot to many people uh, and the fundraiser has gone a good way towards getting, getting there, but just not quite, uh, which is why I'm back here today. Um, so, yeah, I'm ready, ready for any questions if you have any. Has anybody got any questions? Okay. No questions really, but um, just uh, an acknowledgement of your efforts on this, Luke. I know that we've, we've spoken and you've sort of kicked every stone and <laughs> turned over everything you can to, to make it all happen. So I fully support any um, move to try and get you across the line with it, for sure. 
Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Lou. It's an excellent presentation as usual. <laughs> We've seen each other a few times. Uh, I'm absolutely assured that we will have this and look at this very positively uh, on the grounds that with the passing of Queen Elizabeth, this becomes far more poignant and far more written. I was actually at the ceremony when they dedicated what was the old post office. So as a young six-year-old child, so <laughs> that ages me, didn't it? Um, <laughs> and it, it was quite an issue. And uh, it, I think it's recognising these things, particularly in the situations we're living in now, would be very, very effective. So I will support it as well. Thank you, Luke. Um, I think the mayor said in his letter that it is one of the few um, official things happening in the country as it is to celebrate the Jubilee, save for the beacon lighting and the tree planting announced by the Prime Minister. And so it not only has a local significance, but now a poignant national significance too. Mm. Inge. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say well done, Luke. Um, I know that you tried really, really hard to get that extra money and it was always going to be hard through the COVID period and now with everything going up at the rate of knots that it is. So um, yeah, congratulations um, on, on the effort that you put in there. Condolences on, on the passing of the Queen. Um, as you say, it certainly is, is a big, big deal and um, it's going to be very different having having a king um, after after this, this length of time. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say well done on the effort that you made and for putting this all together. Um, it, it's, I think it'll be a really neat thing. So hopefully we can get it across the line for you tonight. So back to you, Richard. Can I just say 100% behind you, Luke, and I'm sure by the end of tonight, you'll have a great result. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Anne. Well, I guess all is left to say is God save the King. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Okay, we need to uh, receive Luke's verbal update. Move Luke, seconded Susan. And okay, um, from the uh, resolution 6 bar 21 bar 79, um, by changing the amount of, to contribute from a thousand to up to $1,800 plus GST from the discretionary fund towards the supply and installation of a memorial park to be purchased from Waikato Stonecraft to commemorate the platinum jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II and the visit she made to Te Amutu with Prince Philip in 1954. Okay, open that's for, a, that's, a that's the proposed one. Um, are there any comments? Okay, uh, but, um, but yeah, it's it's sort of, we haven't got a figure. Are we going to increase the amount we have given? Or so are we, are we altering the existing recommendations? That is, okay. that is our discussion. So the, we yeah. gave 1,000 before and it was yes. 800 short. So yes. my maths, I'm no mathematician, we should potentially be giving and making 1,800. Okay. Right, you yeah. moved that. It will, oh, am Sorry. I allowed to ask Luke another question? Yes. Sorry. Is that all? Is there is there any more any other funds outstanding in respect in, re, in respect of the application? As far as I know, it's three thousand three hundred and forty two dollars, including GST. Uh, but they did suggest that the price of bronze is going up every I, day. So I wondered that. So yeah. if, um, I did we... speak to Stone, Sandra from Stonecraft the other day. She said the quote still stood uh, okay. as That's of the other nice. day, but Craig was not so sure. Okay. Does, oh, sorry, just a quick question too. Does that include the instalment? I believe it does. It, you know, because yes. you have to get the person, they yeah. actually install them. Okay. Yeah. I know that they install them at their own parks, so I believe it does. Okay. Mm. Okay, so we, we actually do need a figure that we're going to um, donate to so we can... Up to an amount? Up to an amount. Up to an amount. Yeah. Up to, up to up to an amount. yeah. Up to 2000 just to Up make to sure in case there's two any years, a little bit of inflation. inflation. Yeah. Okay. God, what a horrible time we live so in. So, is, oh. is that, uh, are you happy with that? Absolutely. I'm happy Still to move that at yeah. 2000. Second. Joel? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. keep away from me. And have you got any comment? No, I'm good. I'm right. happy with that if that covers it. Um, I just wanted to double check, seeing as 
this isn't coming through the normal discretionary fund application where it quite clearly says if there's any excess, we need to give it back. Is there anything that needs to be outlined in the recommendation to cover that if there is excess funds that those are to be returned? Uh, no, for clarity, the, the um, recommendation is, is, is an up to amount. Yeah, so yeah but what, what I'm saying is if we increase it to $2,000 plus GST and Waikato Stonecraft, for example, honour their existing quote and they don't need the full amount. That's, the, that's why it's up to because we're going to pay Waikato Oh, Stonecraft. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's COVID, 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 it's all yeah. eventualities. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty. Yeah. COVID. So we're all good. All good with that, Luke. Yes. Well done, mate. Okay, we need to. Better move we've it. Moved it and seconded. It. Yes, all I'll move it. Seeing as I was the muppet. Against. Carried. Yeah. Way to go, Luke. Cool. Yes. <laughs> when are you likely to be able to get it installed? Do you have any idea? Um, I know last time I spoke to them, there was a 10-week waiting list. Oh, that, was, that was last year. Um, okay. So I would like to think it's gone down. Yeah, okay. Um, so hopefully before the end of the year. Okay. Have you, you got any plans in terms of unveiling? We did have them, but then we went into a lockdown and all sorts of things happened because it had been arranged uh, with the mayor for the mayor to unveil it last year. And yeah. that just kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID lockdown. Still yeah, I'll still be. Yeah, when are you leaving? I'm not leaving until mid December. I don't mean that in a nasty way. When are you leaving? <laughs> I mean, like, when are you leaving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not actually due in Scotland until the 23rd of January, but I'm going to spend Christmas with the family in England. Okay. So, okay. Plenty of time. So, so, Luke, maybe when you talk to Sandra tomorrow, she'll give you a more definite time, as I've yeah. been working with her a bit lately. Yeah. Um, and then you can just keep us updated. That'd be great. Yeah, we'll yeah. do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Also, Luke, just keep Thanks, the RSA updated as well. I'll get a few, few veterans. Thank you. All righty, item eight, Climax Trust Memorandum of Understanding. Gary, welcome. Yep. Yeah. You can ask me when I'm leaving too. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the next train. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It only started when you got to the table. Come on, we have uh, we have a big night to go through, and, all right. and this all started with you, Gary. Um, yeah. Um, look, I'll, I'll pretty much leave this as read. I think you've probably read about it in the newspaper as as well. Um, but we have uh, developed an MOU with the uh, Climax Trust, um, detailing the handover, how it will be stored, and you know, generally. Um, location in the uh, Te Arawai precinct area, um, fundraising responsibilities and communications as well. Um, so that went through council uh, last year, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, and um, um, yeah, I think it was pretty well received. Um, I think Facebook, uh, um, when it was on there, it got, I think, over 100, uh, 100 comments on it. So uh, it it was pretty well received and you know it's good to acknowledge the the work of the team that have done the restoration work um and just noted there um we've got a handover on sun this coming sunday at 2 p.m at the uh, depot at the daphne street depot if um anyone would like to attend you you're all more than welcome to, to do so, so uh, got uh, jim and lou will be there anyway for a start to uh, to uh, uh, just you know, acknowledge the work of the trust and, and accept the train back, and it's it's a very impressive state now. Through you, Chair. Uh, I just like to thank Gary for his uh, you know efforts. We have had a difficult time there for a while, and it was a long and prolonged process that we went through. But you actually retained our uh, call, and we managed to get there with that MOU. It was a number of uh, yeah, drafts that went backwards and forwards for a while, but no, that's excellent. And I think that this is a resolution for a long-standing issue, and uh, they have actually accepted the maintenance of that 
uh, engine until such time it can be relocated, which is a big positive for our. I think it's yeah. um, just over two years since I talked to the board. I think you put bought a paper of all sorts of locations and none of them were really right, but uh, I guess, yeah, hopefully we've landed on something now that'll work. Cool. Any further comments, questions? No, thank you, Gary. Well done. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question, Ange? Or are you just? Just coughing. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I couldn't get the mute off. Sometimes it doesn't click off in time. Hey, Gary, no, um, great to see that that's finally come to, um, you know, like actually cleared up and, and there's a resolution with that. Um, it was just a little random idea that I wondered, is there, is there seeing as it's still stuck at Daphne Street for the foreseeable future, would would it be a possibility to maybe get a, a decent sized sign made up with a photo of the train and the story of the train that could go somewhere down by Te Arawa, you know, by the old Bunnings building? Um, you don't have to say yes or no now. I'm really just saying, would something like that be a possibility? Could well, it be considered? Well, look, Ange, I think um, that's a good point. And I think as we get into the fundraising aspect of the building, we'll need some sort of collateral like that just to get people's um, excitement up. And, and doing, so that might be a good idea to, to do that. One one way we can do that as well. Cool. No, no, it was just sort of, it just seems such a shame that all that work's been done and yet it's still locked away in Daphne Street, which just led me to my very other very quick question. I believe that originally some of the haste around trying to get it positioned was that Daphne Street was going to not be available for it to stay in has that has obviously changed has it uh yeah we've we've got a lease with, with another right of with re rights of renewal down there so um it, it did change hands in the last year or so but we have you know we we do have maintain the lease yeah yep. cool no awesome thank you cool thanks Ange. lovely thank you gary okay um we need to receive the information from Gary Norton. Moved Kane. Seconded Lou. All in favour? Aye. Against? Gary. Thank you. Okay. Item number nine, plan change 26. Welcome, Tony. Kia ora. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I had the wrong, um, the wrong speaker on. So, kia ora koutou in e Um So, this is just a form information report. It's on proposed plan change 26, which is um, the problematic one, which has been forced on us by council. You've probably seen a little bit in the paper around this. Um, I won't go through it. it it's all there. Uh, it is open for submissions at the moment. Submissions close on the 30th of September. Um, so really, this is just an opportunity, if you need any clarification or if you've got any questions around this. Susan. Hey, hey Tony, um, I presume you've caught up with um, Christchurch City Council's uh, um, yeah, interesting uh, turn of events. Um, okay. what, what, what's likely to flow from that, do you think? Or am it's, I putting on the spot? <laughs> no, no. It, it, we're, we're all looking at it quite closely because it's really going to test yeah. the process and it's going to test the unused provisions under the Resource Management Act for the minister to invoke his special powers. So um, if, if you recall, uh, and it was at an open meeting when our council considered this, that mm -hmm. did come up. And one of the things that we were looking at is what might happen. Um, there are a number of powers that the minister can invoke under the Resource Management Act. Man management Act, which have really been used, and they include um, appointing a commissioner to do it for us, um, requiring us to do it, which makes no difference to where we are now because we're already required to do it. Um, potentially calling it and doing it for us and then sending us the bill. So there are a number of um, options available to the minister. So it's untested a little bit, so we're really watching to see what's going to happen out of this one. Yeah, really interesting. So 12 out of the 14 councils have already, you know, approved or put up notification. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll be interested to see what happens. And 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 so, 
once the recommendations from the commissioner come back to us as a as a council, are there similar kind of uh, penalties or um, interventions available to the minister then, if we decide to not deal with any of the recommendations that? or refuse to um, implement the recommendations that come back from that process? So it's slightly different because it's actually prescribed in the legislation what happens in that instance. So, so the hearings commissioners are all independent. They can only make recommendations on this plan change. It brings comes back to council. Um, council can choose to accept or reject the commissioner's recommendations. If they reject it, then, the, then it goes to the minister and the minister makes the final decision. So that's actually set out in the legislation for this particular plan change. So it's fair to say there could potentially be no escaping it. <laughs> well, I think that's fair to say. Um, it depends, it partly depends on the submissions that come through too. Uh, what I can say, and this, is, this will become public information, is that the lot, the tranche of submissions that we've got so far are all sort of lay submissions. We haven't got professional submissions in yet. And what I mean by that is uh, the institutional ones where uh, that they're from consultants or developers or from government agencies. So all the submissions bar one so far have all asked us to decline the plan change and not proceed, um, which is not an option for us. So that's going to be, they're going, they're going to be ones that we have to put through to the commissioner to determine how he deals with those ones. So I think one way or another, we will end up with a plan change that we need to take through the process. Um, it may get modified through the submissions. And I guess if there's a change of government, that probably won't make too much of a difference because this was a, a co-government deal that uh, required us to do this. So, Tony, do you think so, uh, we, we'll see all the qualifying matters actually included in that or not? That's another really good question. So um, we've got, a relatively high level of confidence in the qualifying matters that we had put up, except for two areas. And we think we're going to need additional evidence in those two areas. Um, one of them relates to financial contributions. So we've introduced two new sets of fi financial contributions, one for amenity and um, one for Te uh, Tūri which is the vision and strategy for the Waikato and Waipo Rivers. Um, we adopted Hamilton City Council's baseline information that they'd done. So we've got a relatively solid baseline information. And we also adopted the dollar figures, which were specific to Hamilton, to the Hamilton area. And then we applied what we call a fair and reasonable test. So legally, it's defensible. But technically, we know that the dollars that we've got in the plan change will be tested. So we are looking to get some additional evidence on that. And the other area where we think we might get tested a little bit is we've introduced 91 new character houses based on a report that was provided for us. Um, we have, I guess, a moderate level of confidence uh, in introducing those character houses. And the reason for that is that um, the, level, the level of investigation that was done was probably on the light side. We're required to do a site-by-site -site investigation, and that means going on to sites, having quite a thorough look. Given the time that we had available, this was a drive-by site-by-site investigation. So we expect that to be tested, and we're looking again at, at seeing what evidence we might need for that. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> So supporting it, oh, sorry, Ange, I'll, I'll just ask a question. Supporting the uh, submission is um, really the only sensible thing to do practically in an impractical situation, isn't it? So supporting the plan change, you mean? Yes, the way the council, way it has been presented to us. Yeah. Um. Yeah, well, council is on record to say that we don't support it because it's been forced on us. And oh, yeah, um, but we, we don't have any options. So technically, we've had to put something up, which is the best the best we can do in the circumstances. Um, and I guess if if the community board has a view on it, then that's something that you could put back to council if you do have a particular view on it. Okay, thank you, Benj. Um, so a couple of things, Tony. Um, 
certainly a lot of work has gone into that. I started reading some of the, the submissions coming from the planners and, and different ones, and I'm going, oh, my gosh, I'm pleased that they know what they're talking about because, my whoa, it's getting into some fairly technical stuff in there by the looks of it. But, um, yeah, a lot of work's gone into this, so thank you for, for all your hard work. But is there specifically anything we can do as the Te Awamutu Community Board to support council um, through using the submission process? Mm. Um, that's probably one for Karen, whether the community board is able to put a submission in as a community board. I don't know the answer to that, so it's probably well, a good We one. should be able to. I can't see why we shouldn't, but I suppose it's been, you know, like we can go, oh, on, on behalf of the Te Aumutu Community Board, we support council's position on mm -hmm. the Plan Change 26. Um, but I, I suppose what I'm asking is how are we best to put this across so that it has as much impact as, as it possibly can? So there's probably two options that are running through my mind. So one is one is you could um, make, make some sort of public statement around, as you say, supporting council's position that this is something that has, so at full cost, this is expected to be north of $900,000, which is unfunded. Yeah. Um, this is something that's been imposed by central government. We are really concerned, um, and, and this is council's position, also staff's position, that it will have unintended impacts on infrastructure and the amenity of our towns, because um, if it was implemented as intended, then it would create a whole lot of additional housing that we hadn't planned for. So I guess as a community board, if you felt that that was something you could support, you could do that. Yep. In terms of a submission on the plan change itself, um, if you're able to and you wanted to, you could do that. And it really depends on the stance that you'd like to take. Um, I guess it could be, again, one of those sort of strategic submissions that might support council's position. If you want any particular outcomes, for example, the community board, if you had concerns around the, the loss of uh, urban amenity or the impact on infrastructure, um, you could put a submission in, say, for example, asking to, as far as possible, retain the urban amenity and minimise the impacts on infrastructure. I don't want to. I don't want to put the words in because it's something that you. Yeah, yeah. Today. No, I understand that, but that gives us a, you know, like it, because it's all very well us going. Ah, oh, yes, we support council, but if there's actually a better way of doing it, that that and and more targeted, that that mm -hmm. can be more effective. Then, yeah. um, if we do something, that's what I, I would. I hope that we would like to do. Um, my second question was sort of around, in real simple layman's terms. If basically, if I just want to check that I have got the gist of this correctly, but basically, if I own a house in the street and it could be any street in Waipa, including Kihi Kihi, um, that um, someone, a developer, comes along and purchases the nice big section next to me that can fit a three bedroom, I mean, three bedroom, three house, three story complex, there is nothing I can do to stop that happening under this plan change, is there? Not quite correct. So what, what, where we've ended up, the government wanted all of the, the tier one councils yeah. to permit three by three on every single section. So three houses high, Sorry, three stores, three stories high, yep. up to three houses on any one section. That's what the legislation sought to achieve. We have a blanket, what's called a qualifying matter, over all of our new residential zones. So what we've done is we've created a new medium density residential zone in yep. Kiki, Kiki, Te Aumuru and Cambridge. Yep. But in doing that, we've created a qualifying ma matter across all of that area that says we can't do this without significant impacts on infrastructure that has an effect on the vision and strategy for the Waikato and Waipa rivers. So that's the link. What that means is that as the plan change is proposed, we won't be doing what government has told us to do because anything more than two still needs a resource consent. Okay, and so that's that's how that qualified because I saw those maps and, and okay, so, so 
that's where you've been able to move it to with the work that you've now done to try and protect the house and the street from getting a great big complex built next to it. Yep. That's correct. And we have a relatively high confidence level in that for the point matter to be able to do that. That you will get that through. Yeah. So that's three houses. Yep. Not three stories. Okay. Yep. yep. So if someone okay. wanted to build a second house, and if they meet all the other rules, then under the new rules, they could go up to three stories. Okay. Okay, yeah. I think I got that a bit clearer now. No, thank okay. you. Okay. It is, it is sorry. Okay. So, sorry, so is, is there an opportunity to do what Christchurch has done or, or not? Yeah. Uh, we've already notified. All right. So really, do you know what you might do? Oh, sorry. Yeah. We've already notified. So the plan 26 is out there now and being circulated. So we can't stop that. That's a due process. My suggestion is we do the recommendations and say, yes, we receive the report, all right, and we approve the public notification, which is already out there, received. We're not saying yay or nay, we're just doing what we so have to do. Anyway. I think we're stuck with it. Yeah. So one of the one of the one one of the intriguing options though, um, yes, correct, it has been notified at any point in time the council can withdraw its plan change. So it is conceivable that some other councils might look at Christchurch mm. and resolve or look at the resolution. And again, it would be quite a bold move and staff here would probably be recommending against it because of the pinch consequences. But it is possible to withdraw a plan change once it's been notified. But Christchurch is a big city, right? So... If there's a yeah, number of councils get on board, um, you know, there's an opportunity to push back. There's going to be an election, right? Well, they're a big city and they have a big legal budget as well. Um, so the, the, the cost of fighting litigation against the decision is also a consideration. Susan, Ooh. you're about to say something. And, and, and I guess... Critically, is this isn't an, um, a plan change or a, a mandated plan change that affects the entire country. It only it only affects a, mm. a handful of councils. So there's probably not the enough. Yeah, the uniformity of, of dislike <laughs> or displeasure about about the change changes up and down the country. It really only materially affects a sprinkling in a way that they're not happy. Mm. Uh, there were fourteen, weren't there? Can, 14 tier one councils and, and so, yeah. yeah and 12 have already notified and some of them are comfortable with it I guess give or take but I guess in terms of councils similar to our own Tony there'd be very few I suppose Selwyn off the top of my head a couple of others that are kind of real rural places that are just caught by being high growth as a tier one obviously Christchurch for their own reasons which is kind of a bit left I would no, I don't think anybody would have seen that coming. But um, yeah, it's not quite the blanket universal disapproval that potentially other mandated um, directions from the government have been received or greeted with. Mm. That's not to say I like it. Don't get me wrong. No, no. <laughs> well, yeah, we're pretty clear around the table. We we, we were displeased. <laughs> So, do we uh, do we just want to receive this, or do we want to put in a submission? What's the feeling? Well, I'd be quite keen to support council and put in some sort of submission. Yeah. I mean, even we if have, it's, even have, if it's um, just to, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, even if it's to voice our displeasure at being told that we have to do something like this in WIPA, really, I mean, um, but but I would I would actually be quite keen to support the, you know, the unintended impact on infrastructure and potentially the, the hour um, and, and the urban, you know, and that loss of urban amenity. I mean, it's going to completely change the face of our towns if, if this plan change, well, not if when this plan change goes ahead, 
um, and depending on the appetite for developers to get stuck in and do it. Okay. Um, first and foremost, we need to receive Tony's mm. report. So move low, second, Kane, all in favour? Aye. Against, carried. Okay. And there is a um, submission that we could put in that has been um, adjusted from our discussion that we've had. And Karen's just going to read it. Oh, yeah. And if we want to put in a submission. So I've just kept it basic that the Te Omutu Community Board places the submission in support of Council's position of proposed Plan Change 26 to be approved by the Chief Person in consultation with community, Te Omutu Community Board members. We support that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, move it. I'll move it. So hang, hang, hang on a second. So okay. I'm probably for the Christchurch option, so that's where I'm at. But if the majority of the board want it, then that's... Okay, well, that's well, where they I'm can at. come down to the yeah, vote, yeah, if you like. So moved, Ange. We have a yeah. seconder. I will second that. All in favour? Against? You want your okay, so that's carried. Do what about putting in a uh, can we do that? Can I read it again, Sarah? What's the that the Tiamuta Community Board places a submission in support of Council's position of proposed plan change 26 to be approved by the chairperson in consultation with Tiamuta Community Board members. And is there actually really no other option? No. Do you want to keep it on the microphone, please? My understanding is you can't pull out of the plan change. That was what I heard. Tony said. Yeah, Tony, Tony has said, but, has uh, said that, but that's a council. But, uh, yeah, you know. but, uh, but supporting council's decision to, uh, in terms of their submission, you're moving ahead with it, but with opposition of the actual plan change. Yeah, our right? position yeah, is oppositional. Saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm going a step further, but if the board want to support this, then that's fine. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yep. Did you want to say something? Okay. No further discussion. Cool. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Then. Cheers. Thanks, Tony. Okay, that was a good five minutes, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, um, hot topic. Yeah, oh, yeah, quarterly reports. We've got um, Brian, welcome. Um, what are the what are we transportation transportation yep. report? Thank you very much, much Mr. Chairman. Uh, I take the report as read. I'd just like to make a couple of corrections to the information uh, since the report was drafted at the beginning of August. Uh, obviously, there's there's one there in the table that says that the street lighting in Pollard Drive area is complete. And that was my mistake. It was not complete at all. Uh, so the contractors had done the easy part. They had replaced the old street lights in their current position with new poles, taller poles and uh, new light fittings, but they had not added in the additional lights between those existing lights. So um, the, the chairperson was quite correct that uh, while some work had been done, it hadn't made a big difference because those additional lights were not yet in. So the contractor has been back there um, drilling or thrusting in the cables under the ground for those new light positions. And I'm told that they are on track to have that finished before long. So my apologies for that. Uh, secondly, um, the, the pavement rehabilitation, we had in the Whitmore Street, a contract having been let for that work to be done over summer. Uh, but because the community board has um, uh, put forward the priority for Whitmore Street to be uh, getting the cycleway, uh, walking and cycling upgrade first, uh, we have thought to postpone um, that pavement works on Whitmore Street. We don't want to go and do 
pavement works and then come back and alter the sides of the road with footpaths or curbs or other things. And we would have the public saying to us, well, the council doesn't know what it's doing. It's just fixed the road and then it's come along and dug it up. We don't want to be in that situation. So we've uh, postponed that work with the contractor until that cycleway works is uh, designed and we know exactly what it will look like in that location. So happy to take any questions you have on the report. Uh, I have. I just have a question as to um, choice of uh, location for a footpath. Um, Chestnut Lane out at Prongia is uh, has got nine houses. I know it's not ours, but I, I'd still like to know. <laughs> I'd still like to know why yes. why a footpath has been put on to a, a cul-de-sac with nine houses, right. which. Yeah, so you, you might be aware there's a new subdivision being built mm -hmm. off the end of that, which will connect obviously up to a lot more houses. And so that um, footpath, uh, you will get a lot of use in the future. It doesn't go to any walkway to any... No, it anywhere. links back to um, Crozier Street and then of course to the new pedestrian crossing that we put across McClure Street. And so it is a, a path that kids are um, walking at the moment and parents are walking to the daycare centre on the corner and the school. So yes, it does have um, connectivity for the community back to the, the shopping area and the school. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my case. That's not... Hi, Brian. <laughs> Hi. Um, so 3.7, you've got the bridges on the Memorial Park uh, in place. So last month I mentioned at a community board meeting, I think it was to Brad, but I might be wrong, that um, th there's no signs there to say to the, to the walking people, people that are walking past that you should not enter behind those defensing. So every day, and I had a look again mm. yesterday, there's no signage to say this is a danger, this is a construction site. So people go behind there, jump up onto the bridge and jump off the other side. And it's happening every day. And I just think, right. you know, when it's a construction area, there should be signs there saying it's dangerous. Because if somebody does go behind there and has an accident, they're sure going to blame the council, not mm. themselves for going behind a fence because it doesn't say don't enter. Yeah, I, I guess we're, you know, our construction sites are set up, set up for people with common sense. And so the, the fences there indicate it is a construction site. There are construction fences. And I guess we've got them as close to the stream as we can without them falling into the stream. So if they, I, I guess it's like any road work site or work site, if it's unattended by, by staff, if there is people there and they choose to do something foolish, um, it's not necessarily council's fault. We've, we've taken appropriate steps um, so I think the mere fact of putting up a sign, people you know, old enough to read a sign would know that this is a construction site and the fences are there to keep them out and keep them away from dangers. But if they purposely decide to ignore um, the fencing and take risks, um, you know, there's probably little we can do about that. We, we could spend more money and try and make it even more robust, but if they're really determined, they'll, they'll still try and do it. So, um, yeah, yeah, I can understand where you're coming from, but I still think there should be a sign saying it's, a, you know, it's a danger spot to say, do not enter. Thank you. Right. Hey, um, there were signs up at the start because I definitely, when I walked the dog, there was definitely signs on the Pioneer walkway saying, um, do not enter. So, Brian, shouldn't the um, firm that's done your fencing and stuff, I'm sure there were signs there were definitely signs saying, danger, do not enter. Yep. Well, I will certainly follow but, that up because you're right. Um, you know, there would have been a certain amount of signage there on the job site. Um, yeah, I remember reading right. one, definitely one of them one day on the Piney Walk around the back. I definitely 100% know there was one there. And I'm, I'm just quietly confident I remember seeing one as well at the one by the netball courts. I, the only one I can't really remember is from the playground on that on the playground side of the of the middle bridge. Right. Well, we'll certainly check that out and yeah, check the safety. Well, we do that. Um, we do safety audits on contract work sites, and so I can ask my staff to go and do an, an audit there and check that all the appropriate safety measures are in place. Yeah. 
Yeah, because surely as, as part of their contract with health and safety, they should be providing signage anyway, I would have thought. Yes. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So firstly, thank you. I went and counted the lampposts tonight. <laughs> Took myself for a wee drive. Um, so there's, there's just one there that I kind of questioned, and it's very close to a tree. Um, I don't know if you want to go and have a look, but I kind of thought yeah. there was space either side where they put it that wasn't so close to the tree. And I thought mm, maybe it could have gone a few metres that way or the other way, but it's kind of close to the tree. But that's So is that the first um, um, one opposite the first intersection as you drive in? If you, yeah, so if you come in, if you come in Pollard Drive and you turn up the first street to the left, what's that street called? What the Hiskins or something like that. Hiskins, is it? It's just up there on yep. the left hand side. Right. So it's just up up I think whatever the first street is on the left. Yep. And I thought, ooh, that was clever. Um but we'll, we'll, otherwise, we'll look at that. We'll, we'll look you. at that because thank I you. did spot one other that they'd placed between two trees. And that was not going to be suitable because the trees would get bigger and we got them to shift it. So Yeah, well, I thought this one looks pretty close to me, but you might you might have looked at it and thought, oh no, that tree only gets that big. It's not going to be a problem. Okay. Um, I had a question in regard to um the barrier out on Pokeru Road. Um I caught up with some residents out there recently and I just sort of was asking, is there anything further that, that we could help them with? And they did say that um, that the barrier that you put on that really dangerous corner has been awesome and has stopped a number of people going over the over the into the paddock. However, they said, is it possible to get it extended? Um, further up because apparently they've had some still go and miss the barrier at the top end if you're coming from Pokeru back towards town um, and if you if you drive down there you go oh yeah I can see how that could happen yeah okay well I'll certainly ask my staff to have a look at it I haven't wasn't involved with the design of that one um, but I know that the um, guardrail design procedure is that they're trying to protect a certain hazard and they will have the guardrail extend a certain distance each side of that hazard. Hazard, yeah. Whether that's a drop off or a, a stream or the end of a bridge or something like that. And so it's understood that if um, uh, if you get around the corner and you, you, know, you don't run into the barrier, well, then you've missed the hazard. But if you still leave the road beyond that hazard, then the the side of the road should be clear so that you could run off the road, come to a rest without, you know, running into yeah, a no, you or wouldn't. dropping into a drain. So No, you wouldn't, just see. You go down quite a nasty little off right. the bank, actually. You could probably get airborne if you had a bit of, bit of speed in there. Okay. Well, I'll ask my staff to check that out, Angela. Um, cool. Um, another one, I have sent some antennas in at different times in regard to footpaths that need trimming. And I know I have raised this before, but is there anything that we can do as community board or, or anything we can do as council to encourage um, places, particularly around the college, actually, um, to trim their footpaths so that, you know, because the poor old footpath is getting skinnier and skinnier. Yeah. Or, um, or is that in those sorts of places where they're not in front of people's houses? Because I know, I think you, you said last time, well, normally the people whose home it's in front of will trim their footpath verges as part of their maintenance to make their houses look good. But in those bigger spaces where there aren't houses or there's reserves or like in this case, right along Factory Road and down by the school um playing fields that piece of footpath there is um you know as i say it is getting narrower and narrower yeah yeah so certainly in those locations we would use our maintenance contract to spray or trim those edges if they're neglected areas that nobody looks after so you, you're doing the right thing the Ateno type um call in will yeah. you know allow us to tend to it because there, there certainly are places and we see it where um, 
you know, maybe they, there's a house on the corner and they've got a bank that runs down to a footpath and it's impossible for them to get their mower along the edge of it or, you know, they, yeah. they look after the, the flat, easy side of their section and that, that rough and difficult part they can't look after. And so we tend to, to do that. But we're, um, I guess we don't uh, go looking for it all the time to try and find every piece that's not looking yeah. loved to, to yeah, yeah. take care of it. Um, yeah, I just go have... right around the college is quite bad. Even even on Alexandra Street side of the college is a bit pretty ordinary too, to be honest. Oh. Um, I and I mean, I don't know whether can council just write college a letter and remind them that it's, it would be helpful maybe for them to sort out their road verges for yeah. their footpath in front of the school. And they might be quite happy to do it. I don't know. They, or they might say, oh, no. But, yeah. I guess we have got some discussions that we're opening with the college around the uh, road safety issues in um, North Street and Alexander Street and mm. um, uh, the other streets there. Oh, so Tafio Street, sorry, I couldn't quite remember the, all the mm. names. Yeah, Tafio's uh, not too bad, but Factory yeah. Road and um, Alexandra Street were... Yeah. We're, we're yeah. So we are opening some conversations with them. So you know, perhaps it's and and I, and I guess you know we've certainly heard from people that uh, the footpaths in that location are often not wide enough. You know, because there are at times lots and lots of students all walking there, mm. and um, you know the footpaths are the old standard; they're too narrow, and so they do need to be wider. So I guess when we get to that work and that construction, we can certainly take into account that future maintenance uh, requirements and try and uh, minimise the maintenance. Okay. Um, and just quickly back to that rural barrier, um, if we just leave that with you for now to have a look and you'll just get back to me and then I can let everyone know we'll get back to the Pukuru people and yes. or if we need to do a, a more formal process to try and get you a bit more budget or something to help them out with that or something. Yeah, and, uh, but I guess it, uh, guardrails are expensive things, so I it costs around $200 a metre to install them or more, um, often more. Uh, so we do, you know, target the, the, the worst hazard, and we know that along Pokeru Road there will be multiple other hazards that don't have guardrails, and so we have to uh, prioritise the locations where people are having crashes and where the risks are the greatest. Mm. So we won't always be able to make them longer or put them in other places. Yeah, it was just because that was where the residents had commented and because I said to them, you know, is there anything else around that, that you know, needs addressing? And they said, well, look, it would be great if you could extend that. Um, and there, there's a nice big long spear piece sitting on the side of the road between Ohopo and um, Hamilton. Yes. Oh. Someone's hit it. Yeah. Right, that one. No. It's <laughs> well, saving lives every day. It might day, be opposite right? Jerry Road, is it? There's, there's some there, I think. <laughs> so there's a bit of free stuff, Brian. No, thank you for that. Lovely. No further questions? Thank you, Brian. We thank just need much. to um, receive. We'll do Brad's as well at the same time. So that's um, Brad's community services report as well. So mover for receiving. Oh, move them, like. Second, Ange, all in yep. favour? Right, carry. Thank you. Great. Cool. Uh, um, so I'll highlight a few quick points from my quarterly report, which um, obviously was from ending, ending 30th of June. So <clears throat> it is a little bit dated now. Um, the, the, this last quarter of the financial year saw um, graffiti get significantly worse again, um, sort of progressing from the small word here and there to full on wall coverage, especially over in, in Cambridge actually. Um, so staff had brought in a, a contractor who's done a real good job. Um, it's, it's a contractor that's over and above uh, our normal toilet cleaning contractors who, who to date have been dealing with a lot of the, the graffiti. Um, it does come with a greater cost and it comes with our general maintenance budget. Um, we're actually working with Brian's transportation team at the moment to take a paper to service delivery um, around some options um, for adding security um, cameras into, into towns and uh, potentially our skate parks as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the project implementation plans of the Te Aumuru War Memorial Park um, is, is, in, is in track. So um, my report last month uh, probably supersedes um, what's in our cooler report here. Um, 
and we are looking to hopefully set up a, a, a catch up with the maintenance group this month. If we can get that across the line, um, Craig's months away with work, but we're working with um, someone else, Murray Downs at the moment, just in terms of trying to set up a time there. Um, finally, just a quick one. Um, we've had some success in our reserve plan team. We had a bit of a gap for quite a period of time. Um, and so now we're commencing some of our reserve management plans that have been um, on the work program for some time, but unable to be resourced. So the first one, which is in, in training at the moment, actually having a, a hui tonight uh, for the working group, is the 205 Sainsbury Road Reserve Management Plan over in Porongia. And uh, we're in the um, early procurement phases of um, uh, Naroto, Naroto Reserve Management Plan. So there are a couple of big bits of work coming through um, uh, in the next period of time. So happy to take any further questions on the remainder of the report. Very happy to receive it. But just quietly with Memorial Park, you've still got the fence in there as well. So the stone fence in the front of the Memorial Park. And this one, we decided that that was... Yeah, not, yeah so this is... A, it's the old report, yes. just to make sure. Um, I put The other thing I was just going to mention to you, I put the flags up for the plan the other day, but we found that the lanyard and Kiki is on the ground and being torn off. And the one at Memorial Park, I think we need to just get them taken down and new lanyards put up. Right. They're getting like me, age. Okay. Well, oh. I've got something to say, of course. <laughs> I've um, read off, I'll catch up with you and write you an email because I've been talking to Garth from Alexander House today. And um, four weeks ago, somebody was meant to get back to him from council and they didn't. Um, but because he was concerned that it was showing that the burial numbers were a lot higher than the ash interments. And very basically, without going into depth at this stage, he said because over COVID you could bury people, but you couldn't inter the ashes. And that's probably what gives a false reading that there were more burials and ash interments because people are still waiting to come back from overseas to do those services. Yeah, so um, I was to clarify because I thought uh, Anna, um, who's working on that piece of work for us, I thought she'd been back in touch with Garth on that. And so um, she'd done a piece of work to look at the numbers and they're very comparative. So it is that the numbers do stack up. Um, and I think he was also just suggesting something about um, some car parking there as well. And so we've taken that feedback on board as part of, you know, one, one part of the consultation that we've been doing, which is now closed. So. No, he. Um, I've got other things here too, which I'll talk to you about. But he did say someone called Anna rang him, and he was at a funeral, and she didn't ring back. So there was no correspondence there. Okay. Yes, Susan. Um, I was approached by a funeral director recently, and he asked me if there was any appetite for ash walls to be installed in our cemeteries, um, given the you know, limitation of space that we have available in cemeteries, it seems very, it's a blindingly logical place to go rather than relying on lawn ash interment. Is that something that we're considering? Yeah, 100%. So at the moment, we're doing our concept plans for um, the new or the capacity we've got in our existing um, cemeteries, and that is definitely one of the options we're looking at amongst others. Um, there's a whole well, there's a whole, right, whole wide range, but there's um, a few other options as well. Called There's another thing called biopods, which is like a composting sort of thing. So looking at some of those. Um, so, yeah, so the, the feedback, the consultation period so is closed, closed now. And so we're just collating that feedback well, that's been collated and working that up into some concept plans, which we'll be bringing through for um, consideration. Okay, when would those concept plans be? They're in draft form now, so they can't be too far away. We have to come back to you on a... On a Okay, yeah, from the, yeah. cool. and were there submissions or feedback from people requesting ash walls? Um, or still just something that you think that it was, it was, it was a wide range of feedback, but it's definitely something that we've been considering anyway. Okay, cool. I mean, it, it seems a really logical mm. step. Yeah, there, there is a cost to them, but um, there's also a cost in running our space, so absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. firm is probably a little bit more expensive than walls, <laughs> but yeah, no, cool. Awesome. I look forward then to seeing those concept plans. Cool, cheers, Brad. Sure. Have you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll talk to Brad later. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ange. Yep. A uh, couple of things. Um, Brad, I think I antennaed this, but just in case I didn't, can I please pass on to you? Again, um, walking in the park, I have noticed that um, the orange emergency fencing netting that we'd put, well, not we, that you guys had put up to stop people getting into the 
river um, at the top end of the duck pond and also um, up by the Tafio Street Bridge um, have both either been stomped on or fallen down or they just need fixing up and retightening. Sorry, is this in... Oh, the War, War Memorial Park. Park, sorry, oh. War Memorial Park, sorry. Thank you, I'll look into that. Yep, so just while I was thinking of it. Um, secondly, um, I, on the plan going forward for the next steps for the War Memorial Park, um, are these plans for the um, heritage, uh, heritage plan and the garden maintenance plan. Um, are community board going to be privy to those before they're actually approved and put through? Will we doing those pieces of work, as I said, um, yeah, like you're doing them now, yeah. but once they're drafted up and you've got sort of what's going on, will we be privy to see those prior to them becoming set in concrete and that is the plan? Yeah, I think so. So as I said in our last uh, monthly report, that we'll be looking to work with the maintenance group down there and um, the RSA and our monthly partners. And so, yeah, we can share that with the community board um, as, as well. Cool. And then just a very quick final question, um, just in regard to the fact that your report was placed into um, our current agenda with things that were still wrong. Um, how come that couldn't have been amended before it got put into our into our agenda? This report was signed off by SPN, uh, not SPV, Service Delivery, so um, it's, it's been carried straight forward. Um, so it's, it's so just, once you know, once it's, something's been signed off, even though it's got something that's wrong, it doesn't have an amendment put into it, so that it still gets put into additional publications with the wrong information because for me um some you know like we know because we were at that meeting um but for someone just coming in and reading this community board agenda they don't know that that information is wrong and we're presenting it to the public as being correct and yet we all knew last month that you'd come in and said Oh, look, I'm really sorry about this information. That's actually not quite right. But we're continuing to use it and pass it off as being correct. And I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just saying, is that actually kosher? Or is that an appropriate thing to be doing? It's certainly, I'll take, I'll take this one thing. So it's certainly um, it's something that we'll uh, have to look into into the future. It's just the report that has been presented to the service delivery has been, is the report that's now presented to the community board. Um, I will we'll take that um, and under consideration for the future. Yeah, I just, I mean, it was just something I thought, oh, actually, um, I understand, you know, how it came to be, but I, I just thought, oh, I'm just going to ask the question on that one. So, yeah, cool. Thank you. You make a good point, Ange, but um, I, I guess it might be helpful potentially into the future if there's sort of an addendum, not necessarily added to the report per se, but when that's presented in an agenda, perhaps there should be an addendum, addendum or some kind of clarification that there was a, a further verbal update upon presentation that, you know, rectified yeah. shortcomings in paragraphs, blah, 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 or miss whatever. Um, and if that perhaps could, perhaps could be um, reflected as an addendum of some sort, just because Angie's right, it's on public record and short of attending our meetings, you wouldn't realise in that. And especially, I suppose, when it comes into something like this, which is really a hot topic, you know, hotly followed by people who are really, really passionate about it might, might pay to, yeah. Yeah, that would be a perfect idea, yeah, because you probably can't, alter the original record that was you can't you can't change yeah. the actual report because it was delivered back then but yes. it, for the purposes of um presenting that report at the community board there be, could be some kind of clarification yeah. lovely cool thank you all right no further questions you got all that written down karen yeah. <laughs> she's all over of course it. she oh, is nice. yeah sorry karen all righty, now we move on to item number 11, the uh, discretionary fund allocations. Um, you know, we... Uh, can... And we will probably need to uh, go into public excluded in relation to the uh, financial side of some of these discussions. And then we can 
um, put the results <laughs> out at the end of it. The only thing we can discuss is the financial decision yeah. to make, allocate funding as a public. Okay. okay. So, do we need to? Well, not at this stage. You know, I haven't got anything that I'm querying <laughs> from, a, I don't think, from a financial perspective. No, nor have I. Okay, okay we've only got 19. Come on. I. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I find that uh, these these um, funding applications are quite, yeah, some have full financials mm. and others don't have them. It's, is it in the criteria that they are to supply us with financials? It is. So why can we accept them? Who hasn't got one? Have, most of them. You'll find it. You'd find that some of the voluntary organisations won't have auditors' accounts. They'll just have a, a registering you know, a statement. That's all. Some of the small ones. So the requirement is that the um, applicant must uh, attach a copy of the most current bank statement and annual accounts or financial statement. Yeah, and a fair number of these haven't so, even got that. Uh, so. That well, that means they shouldn't have been approved for us to, because they haven't got all of the details that they're supposed to give us. Oh, fine. Not all of them are audited, but as far as I could see, most ha all had financial, uh, an annual financial report um, present. <laughs> I, well, yeah, without um, going the without going through the whole lot, I could I could pull out one right away, but I don't know whether that's appropriate at the moment. Um, well, well, which which one? What do you want to go to Should we go into public excluded so we can Just address so the issue of whether yeah, there's yeah, apparent issues in yeah. terms of the shortcomings yeah. for in a financial yeah. sense and then. Okay. And so, just to verify that. Okay. Okay. So I'm happy to move that um, recommendation. We move into public excluded for that purpose. Do we have a second? I'll second okay. it. 